Welcome to the Build It to Build It podcast. I'm excited about our next guest. His name is Michael Shepard. We had an in-depth conversation about treasury investments, fine arts. Amazing opportunity to hear from somebody who's built a company from basically zero with one of his business partners to over $5 billion worth of uh, highly appreciated fine art. We're going to dive into some of the mindset, some of the leadership, some of the strategy, and also the detail investment opportunities with their group. I know you're going to love the podcast. Check out the episode right now. Hey, Michael Shepard, welcome to the show. Excited to have you. Would you give our listeners a little bit more about your story and your current focus? Well, you betcha. Uh, my story, I don't know where to begin, <laughs> but uh, I think we need to focus on Treasure Investment Corporation uh, for now, certainly, even though I uh, presently serve as chairman of the board and CEO of a gold mining company as well. But for the last uh, six, seven years, um, Mark Russo and I, who have known each other since 1998, uh, and have been partnering in different uh, projects. Uh, Mark gave me a call and said uh, he would like to incorporate Treasure Investments, something he's been doing for 38 years in fine art, uh, sculptures particularly, but that he would like to prepare this company to uh, go public and that I have had that experience in the past and uh, would I help him. So I got permission from my board of directors at Nevada Mining Company. And uh, I've been doing something now with Mark, uh, raising money, uh, preparing to go public, doing whatever it takes to position this company, basically from an entrepreneurially driven company to a professionally managed one. And that is my gifting and my expertise. And that is where we are today. Fantastic. And in today's episode, we're, we're going to be talking about... Um, the ability to build wealth within the 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 art world, I guess is the best way to put it, right? But but more than that, like so much more for what you guys do. And and I love your background being that you're the chairman of the board or the CEO of the Nevada Mining Company. And you're also a partner and uh, director of investor relations at Tre Treasure Investments Corporation, which was so cool to be able to meet you uh, at the uh, family office event in Los Angeles and see some of the most amazing pieces of art I've ever seen for sure. And what you guys are creating there. So what would you say is the number one, you know, foundation of how you guys have built, uh, you know, really hundreds of millions to billions of dollars worth of art collections and an investment company? With Mark having the visionary portion of it and being entrepreneurially driven, and because he came from a family of six generations of artists going back to Genoa, Italy. Uh, he has always been, his life has been fine art, whether or not it's paintings or sculptures. And he himself, himself is an artist. But in 1998, when we met, I was doing financial planning seminars for um, charities and taking charitable trust to raise money uh, and teaching people how to do that, specifically CPAs and estate planning attorneys. And I was doing a seminar in Lake uh, Oswego, Oregon, and uh, Mark uh, invited me to lunch. And he had an idea. And the idea was uh, simply, uh, I uh, actually, Mark talking now, um, had a piece of uh, fine art and I uh, sold it to a friend of mine, a neurosurgeon, for $5,000. And about a year later, that uh, doctor donated that sculpture to a charity, and they had a big black tie fundraiser gala events, the type that you and I go to all the time. And um, he sat there in the audience, and they had a live auction. And that went from $5,000 to $50,000 with 20 bidders still bidding. And when the gavel went down at 63000 Mark went, oh my goodness, that's a million dollars. This could be a business. So he shared that with me 
I know this sounds crazy, but on a napkin <laughs> over lunch at a diner in Lake Oswego. And he said, what do you think? And I said, it's a no brainer because raising funds is not fun. It's hard to ask people for money. But the easiest way to ask people for money is to have them at a dinner, at a charity with a charitable cause they love in a live auction, which is just exciting. And if they're the winner, everybody applauds and they've done a good deed and they feel good about it. And hence, we started that business. And wow. um, it just took off. And Mark and I raised millions and millions of dollars. We stopped counting at 50 million. And bless his heart, he ended up selling the company, retired in his 30s, and uh, then ended up restarting it again after the NDA was over. And uh, now we're doing this. And so it sounds like two things so far. It's compelling vision and a partner who could believe and come alongside to help support that vision and the growth of a company at a young stage. And then he coupled that with deep roots from his creative, artistic, and fine art family, right? And um, and and then and then coupling, I guess, even the last one, I guess, would be adding the ability to raise raise capital, right? And 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 then do that in a way that's it's an experience, right? It's not just it's in fine art itself. Talk about how fine art creates that experience because it is something that's that's it's it's different than anything else. Well, art is something that is almost unexplainable, uh, separate from an investment. It is what you like, it is what you love. Not necessarily what you need. It's more of an impulse purchase. Now that we separate that first profit center, which was charities and live auctions. And once you move from that more ethereal situation and more emotional situation, you make it a business. And when you make it a business, you think, what's the key to business? You know, I live, as you know, Brett, in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's the home of Christian music. It's the home of country music. It's Music City, USA. But for every one person who makes it, there are literally 10,000 who don't. I also served for five years as the head of the mass market music division for Thomas Nelson Publishing Company. And the key to marketing, the key to sales, the key to revenue, the key to company success is not necessarily the product, it's distribution. And so with that, we needed to create a distribution model. And we did, and now we have 96 galleries across America who are distributing our product. And the model is very simple. We create the art, we consign the art, and we split the revenue 50-50. Identically with the original charitable business model, we do all the work for the charities, and at the end of the day, we split 50-50. That's just an easy model. And that's just number two of five different profit centers we have. Okay, this is incredible. I'm going to pull some of these things out. So it sounds like, A, making it a win-win for whatever group that you're aligning with, whether it be charitable causes or whether it be the galleries, right, for a profit. And then it's establishing a distribution channel of 96, you know, people that believe and are with you and are, are going to be able to to uh, tell the story. <clears throat> I also like how you said art is something almost unexplainable, right? It's not what you need, right? Uh, but it's definitely what you want. And, and it's, it's, it's not the traditional investment, right? And so it's understanding how to, how to connect those dots. I'm curious, what is the hardest earned wisdom that, that you had, you guys had to learn over the years, like whether through your success or your setback, what do you feel like was like the one that, oh, that was the hardest one to, to learn or earn is a good way to think about it. That wisdom piece that propelled you guys to explode. Well, that's a tough question, Brett. I guess the most difficult 
challenge that we faced was telling the story in such a way that non-art buyers, but investors who were not necessarily in love with the art, but were in love with making money. And if we could combine the two by doing something that heretofore had never been done in business that I'm aware of, and it is a concept called matching consideration, where if you invest in a company that is extraordinarily profitable, virtually free from debt, experiencing explosive growth, and looking at an exit strategy, that's a win-win for the investor and for the company. What if you could secure their investment? Because really, until you go public, what really is your exit strategy unless you sell the company? It's really dividends. And you're not in a position with a growing company at the rate in which we've been growing for these past six years to issue dividends because you want to put all the money back into the company. So the concept was this, and this is the coolest thing ever. If you invest in treasure investments, we will secure your investment dollar for dollar. Let's say you invest $50,000 we will give you $50,000 immediately in artwork that you select. And we've got 2,600 selections. So you could do wildlife, patriotic things with eagles and flags, religious, modern, whatever it is that excites you. Now, some of the people, many of the people, me included, I'm not an art guy. And... I didn't know what to choose, but the concept itself, if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for 290 other investors. And so people said, well, great, Let, let's come visit and let's look at the art and let's make a choice. You saw just a few of the, of the artwork, but what if you saw now as you have in the, in the museum on the video, but what if you could choose from a couple thousand pieces of art? you'll find something that you and or your wife fall in love with. But you know what? Even if you didn't, I'll convert what could have been art to extra shares for you because we want to make sure that you win and that you're happy. Absolutely amazing, Michael. Uh, that was that was uh, incredible. By the way, you can learn more uh, about Michael Shepard by going to treasureinvestmentcorp.com. That's treasureinvestmentcorp.com. They're actually located north of Portland in the battleground Washington area over the river. Um, and uh, they they are um, one of a kind, honestly. I, so a couple things I want to pull out of that, right? Number one, it sounds like you guys found a creative solution to bridge the gap between the art lover and the investor and or the money lover, right? And I wonder if how funny it is sometimes the married the married spouse, one is one, one is the other, right? And you're saying, how do we figure out a way to tell a compelling story with the art and a compelling story with the return on investment? And you said, okay, let's put our, in a sense, let's put our art where our mouth is, or let's put our money where our mouth is. And let's let's make a matching consideration where if you put at least $50,000 investment into Treasury Corporation, we will we will create art or we have art that dollar for dollar will match that and that's you get to keep that that is yours right and your investment is now with the company is that a fair summary so far Michael on that matching consideration yes sir excellent now you couple that with a, a lucrative exit strategy let's start talking about this because some of the stuff you guys are doing has never been done before in fact why don't we focus like a laser on the David and what's happening there. And, and just how exciting that is. Well, you know, I'm a storyteller, so let me back it up a little bit from David with your permission, Brett. Um, in uh, November of 19, no, 2000, 
21, uh, Mark asked me to uh, go to Florence, Italy to meet with Ferdinando Marinelli, one of the world's oldest and finest uh, foundries in the world. Uh, the only company that had uh, permission from the Vatican uh, to take what they call posthumous original master molds. In 1928, um, Ferdinando Marinelli's grandfather was commissioned by Pope Pius XII to come to Rome and secretly take plaster Paris molds of the entire Vatican collection and hide them away and store them because the Pope felt and sensed that another world war was coming. And basically that remained a secret until I think in 1972 it was some maniac took a hammer to the Pieta. You may remember that it was historic and they needed to restore it. Well, the then present Pope knew about this situation. So they called Ferdinando Marinelli's uh, grandson and they were able to take the original master mold and restore the Pieta to its original um, piece. So now that we discovered that, Mark discovered that, he asked me to go. And I said, well, I'm not going. And he said, well, Michael, why not? Because we rarely disagree. We're, we're kindred spirits. And um, he said, well, uh, we, we have, you have to, Mark, it's COVID. I'm not going. He said, well, I've not been vaccinated and you have. And you just really need to take one for the team. So honestly, Brett, Barring a phrase from uh, Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, it was the worst trip of my entire life. But it ended up being the best trip of my entire life business-wise. This was a true blessing. I spent a great deal of time with this phenomenal, iconic Ferdinando Marinella. And he, li I listened to his story and at the end of the day, we were blessed with something. I actually call it an answer to an unasked prayer because now Treasure Investments, the company had only been in business for a few years, has the exclusive rights to produce from the Vatican collection, 72 pieces, one and one only, the first, the last, and the only Vatican collection pieces in precious metal. We can do them in silver and we can do them in gold. And oh my goodness. And that goes back to your question regarding the silver David. Okay, pause there. I got to unpack this. This was it's so incredible. And you're right. That is an amazing story. I feel like it's out of, I thinking about, uh, you know, um, who is who is Indiana Jones, you right? And he's he's going on a quest, <laughs> right? To some 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 far far place overseas. And he's capturing some like, you know, chest in, in, a, in a cave somewhere. And essentially you took a little journey like an Indiana Jones and that, and reluctantly too, right? You weren't necessarily excited to go with all the stuff going on, but you took one for the team and you went there and you secured the exclusive rights for over 72 uh, cast forms to be able to re replicate uh, silver and gold of of some of the most amazing art in the history of the world. Is that a fair summary? Did I miss anything? Uh, you got it right, except that Indiana Jones knew what he was doing. <laughs> got it. So now let's fast forward to the David, right? And what's happening right now, right? As we speak, uh, making history, right? Talk about where you're at with that. And um, and just, just tell the story of the David. Well, my goodness gracious, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Ferdinando Marinelli himself and Dr. Alexandro Cecchi flew in from Florence to Portland and uh, we picked them up. We spent four days with them and uh, we took them all over, but especially, most especially to the foundry. Um, 
where we had scheduled silver to be smelted right then and there to go into the master mold that Ferdinando had supplied to us via a red wax, which is the old wax, the lost wax method. And Ferdinando was there with Dr. Chetsy. Dr. Chetsy was the curator for the Michelangelo Museum in Florence for 38 years and presently serves as the chairman of the board and director of Casa Burante, the house of Michelangelo. And they were right there to see a dream become reality, a pouring of David, the most iconic piece of art perhaps in the history of the world now being poured in 0.9999 precious silver metal. It was goosebumpy. It was the coolest thing. It was tearful how neat it was to have happened. Now we knew that it was going to be great, but when we produced the Pieta, which was the first piece of the Vatican collection produced, and we were able to not only produce it, but unveil it in Las Vegas uh, at the uh, Mirage, at the Freedom Fest in front of 3,000 people. And guess who unveiled it with us? An old friend of mine, Steve Forbes. It was really cool. So it was Steve and Mark, my brother, and me, and we unveiled it. And oh my goodness. And it was broadcast worldwide through Fox Nation to over a million people. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, you can't strategize. You can't plan these things. This was a gift and such a blessing for our shareholders. And for me to be part of it is just the coolest thing ever. Absolutely. And by the way, you can learn more about uh, everything that Mr. Shepard is talking about by going to Treasure Investment corp.com it's investments with an s corp.com treasure investments corp.com okay so that is amazing so now let's talk about the dollars now right let's talk about the investor right so if someone's listening to this and part of why we're we're we're, we're, we're talking about this is um you know we're, we're, we're sharing like how do you build to billions right how do you build in a way where in this ever-evolving landscape of being an entrepreneur, you know, the journey from a million to a billion is not just a, a leap uh, of faith, but it's it, it it takes it takes transformation, it takes relentless innovation, it takes strategic foresight, it takes commitment to growth, it takes commitment to working with other people, um, learning learning how to how to tell stories, learning how to have a business model. So now let's let's dive into that part of it. And let's focus like a laser on the investor, right? If someone says today, wow, how much is that David going to sell for, right? If you can imagine, let's just estimate est 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 an estimate, right? And talk about the ability to be an investor alongside of inside of Treasury, Treasury Corp, right? What does it look like? Well, since I'm an investor myself, and of course, I would never place myself in a position of trying to present an opportunity like we have uh, and a product like we have and an investment like we have unless I did it myself. And so my wife and I, we've now been married 59 years. Bless her heart. If she were Catholic, she'd be sainted by now. Um, we, we decided that this was something that the Lord was leading us to, not to over-spiritualize it, but it's just the truth. And uh, my directors gave me permission to do this, and um, we wanted to invest. Now, as the first investors, obviously we got in at a, at a, uh, at a much lower price. And as it's grown over the time, the price of the shares, uh, we have 300 million shares authorized, 282 million uh, issued as of this date. So we have 18 million to go for a, a $20 million raise. And so from an investor's perspective, what would I want to look for? If I loved fine art, that's a no brainer. 
because as an alternative asset, fine art has outpaced the markets who have done extraordinarily well for 30, 40, 50 years at about 30%. It's amazing. But fine art heretofore had basically been for the uber rich because they could then go to Sotheby's and Christie's and buy a piece. And 10 years later, when they wanted eight times their money or five times or double, you know, most investors are looking basically uh, at two times their money in five years, right? I mean, that's that's what they would love. And fine art far outpaces that. Now, another alternative investment is precious metals. So you want some degree, 5%, 10% in precious metals in your portfolio. And you can do that at a very low cost. And you're looking at, again, a nice return on your investment in maybe five to eight years. Or gold as a hedge buy. Now, what if you could can actually combine those two things, fine art with precious metal simultaneously, and you could do it with a company that is not only profitable, but was profitable when all of their five business units, no, four of their five business units were closed down for nearly two years with COVID. All of our trade shows were gone. The galleries were shut down. We couldn't do any charitable live auctions. But Mark, because of his 38 years experience, continued to create and sell monuments. Monuments are defined as 20% over life size, basically. So for people who were still wanting monuments for their homes, for developers who were still building, for uh, Black, you know, Black Rock Country Club, which they have, I think, 26 sculptures now, uh, you could sell. And so we were still profitable. So now you combine all of that from an investor point of view. Five profitable business centers stand alone. Precious metal, fine art, and a nice exit strategy via dividends or the sale or perhaps going public, which now we really think might not be in the best interest of our shareholders. Got it. Does okay. So the impacts question? of this, the impacts of this. So yeah, all of it sounds incredible. So now let's talk about real numbers, right? To break it down for everybody, right? So on on average, you know, if you put a million dollars in, let's say at today's, and what's today's share price right now? You, you said uh, approximately what? What's the share price? Well, uh, interesting that you would ask because this is really good news for your 87 clients and beyond. And for you, Personally, at the summit in Beverly Hills, and you met us in Fort Lauderdale, and then later at, at the summit, um, because the documented private placement memorandum and subscription agreement is all at $5. And because when we went, when I went to Wall Street last February, and they said they would like to take us out between 750 and 10. We then documented the price, share price at $5. We offered a 20% discount at the summit in Beverly Hills. And when you and I started talking and with Dan Palmer um, on our Zoom call and on private conversations, I went back to Mark, who is the final decision maker uh, and the majority shareholder. And I said, I'd like to do something special for this group because this group is special. And what we can now offer your folks is not a 20% discount, but a 50% discount. So your folks can come in at $2.50 per share. Oh my goodness. I think that our partnership is going to exponentially take off that's amazing by the way if you want to get started you can go to um uh two places you can connect with michael but if, you, if you're watching or hearing this make sure you talk to, hey you talked to brett swartz heard you on the heard you on the podcast heard you on uh, saw, saw saw the emails uh but you can also go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com 
and we can you can learn more about this. You do need to be an accredited investor, okay? And it's something to understand. Um, and so, um, and and this is uh, this is uh, not a, this is not a solicitation, but an opportunity for you to look at this. Um, uh, so, at, first of all, thank you. Uh, more than generous, really exciting. Um, so let's break that down. Let's imagine someone did put in, you know, at a million dollars at two fifty at two dollars and fifty cents a share, and I mean, fast forward, either go public or you get bought out private, or or even just people want to be a long term, right? They want to they want to continue to you know have dividends paid out. Let's imagine that David sells for a hundred million dollars. I don't know, some, some or more, right? I don't know what it's going to sell for. You, you maybe have estimates on that on the silver and the gold, just kind of give a feel for like how those numbers break down um, on an average dividend. What, what would it look like if the company were to hold for a long term or if it were to get sold? Well, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> but when I don't know something, Brett, I refocus on what I do know. And here's what I do know. Um, the silver Pieta, which was our first Vatican piece, has appraised officially at $172 million. Now, we don't know what it's gonna sell for, and therefore we don't know what the dividend's gonna be. But let's say we sell it for 50 million, only 50 million, less than a third of its you know, value. What do we do with that 50 million? Well, what's our use of proceeds? We have a decision to make with the officers. Well, we'd like to build a new foundry. Well, that's $5 million. Um, what else will we do? Well, we wanna fulfill, we have, uh, last year we did about 14 million in revenue. But this year for 2024, we already have 19 million in open purchase orders. So we want to fulfill that. So how much is that going to cost since we own the inventory while it's being sold? For example, um, in our galleries, as we talked about, it's on consignment and we split 50-50. So we still own that. So let's say that's another 5 million. So now we got 40 million left. So you divide 40 million by 282 million shares. And now you've got yourself a potential dividend. Now, that's for the silver Pieta. Well, let's say the Jackson Pollock signed in 1951, appraised at a, I don't know, 150 million. Let's say it sells for 50 million, same scenario. And then you've got the Belvedere Torso at 65 million. You actually saw Michelangelo's uh, wall hanging sculpture the only one that's in his home in Florence, you saw that piece and that's 45 million. So that may sell first or they may all sell together to the Louvre. I, you think I'm gonna say Paris, France, but I'm gonna say Abu Dhabi because they bought the rights to the Louvre name. And they are the world's largest, newest museum looking for pieces. And uh, we had we have an interested party, let me say, that we are in discussions with who's a Muslim and he's interested in the Pieta. And my question is why? It's the most iconic religious piece ever created in history. And he looks at us and he puts up a finger. And what does that mean? I've got, there are 300 shapes and princes that I'm in competition with, and I will have the only one ever created in history. It'll be mine. That's why he's interested in it. Absolutely amazing. So cool and so exciting. And by the way, I think it's actually a good answer. And this is part because it's art and it's fine art and it's solely, it's so highly appreciated. And so the key is some of them are going to sell quickly. Some of them are going to sell, take longer. You're constantly creating new, new product. And the revenues are going to to fluctuate, and sometimes it's going to be larger. But to me, I would love to be an owner of the business for long term. In fact, I'd love to just continue to continue to have you guys do an amazing job of telling the story. And but of course, at some point, there's going to be an exit. 
Um, a part of also what we do on the podcast is talk about capital gains tax, right? And estate tax. And that, you know, at a certain point, there's a time to plant, water, right? Cultivate and harvest, right? Uh, and, and, and that's a big, big challenge with a lot of, a lot of uh, people who've gone from a million to a billion and or building up, you know, having that tax flow exit strategy. And I just want to remind our listeners, if you're listening to this, you can, we, we have a solution for that. And in fact, it's an amazing solution. One of our companies called Capital Gains Tax Solutions. You can defer the capital gains tax. You can eliminate the estate tax on artwork, on collectibles, cryptocurrency, businesses, real estate, but especially art, artwork, because artwork is taxed at even a higher rates. It's massively taxed, okay? So be very aware of that. Before you are to sell, you can defer the capital gains tax using a deferred sales trust. You can also eliminate the estate tax using a DST 2.0. This is massive because the stepped up basis does not solve for estate tax, okay? And so you can go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com to learn more about that. But I just want to remind all of our listeners, as you're building two billions, make sure you're also building, uh, building a billion dollar tax flow plan. Because when all of these sales start happening, there's a massive amount of tax and you don't want to get caught paying too much of your fair share if there's ways to go around that. Just go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com to learn more. That being said, uh, Mr. Michael, we are running out of time. Are you ready for the lightning round? One thing I want to mention, though, if I can piggyback, Brett, on what you just said from a tax situation, this is exactly why at Beverly Hills, I set up a private meeting with Richard Wilson and Dan Pinkerton of Pinkerton uh, Retirement Fund. He has AUM of $2.3 billion and is the top 1%. And what he and I and Richard and Mark and I are working on is the establishment of the Michelangelo Fine Art Fund. And that is critical because that then combines all the assets we have now bookable, 3.2 billion, with what we're going to have, 5 billion. And people then, like family offices, can come in and put in, I mean, it's just, it takes me just as much time to raise 100,000 as I could raise 5 million or 10 million because the family offices can write those checks. And that then they can then buy a unit, be it 5 million or 10 million or 50 million of a $5 billion fine art fund. And that dovetails with exactly what your company and Capital Gains Tax Solutions is doing. That's yeah. why I, I got so excited. I appreciate that. And by, and by the way, it also works for shares in stock, public or private. You can assign, assign the interest, sign the shares, sell the shares to the trust prior to the close. It's really, really, really cool and exciting. In fact, we wrote a book about it called Building a Capital Gains Tax Exit Plan while we were just talking about it. And in fact, we had Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank, who also was at the Beverly Hills speaking at that conference. And he didn't even know you could do it on public stock. Right. Ours work also works for public stock, which most strategies don't, but it definitely works for private stock or public stock or artwork or crypto or business or real estate sales. It's all of it you want, but you want to make sure you have that plan in place. That being said, you can pick up the book, Building a Capital Gains Tax Exit Plan on Amazon. Let's dive right into the uh, to the lightning round. Here we go. Knowing what you know now, Michael, if you could go back to your 25 year old self, what's the one golden nugget and make sure to tell yourself to do? Talk less listen more, forgive yourself because you're forgiven. Beautiful. Love that. Question number two, what's the number one book you've recommended or gifted the most in the past year? The Bible. Beautiful. Question number, amen to that. Question number three, um, what are you most curious about right now? When Jesus is coming back. That's a great question right now, especially everything that's going on in the world. So yeah, uh, uh, thank you for sharing that. Question number four, number one leadership quote or theme that you strive to live by? He is no fool who is willing to give up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. Amen to that. Uh, next question. Have you considered using ChatGPT and or are any of your team members using ChatGPT for automation for communication? No, sir. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. 
Uh, and, uh, and the very last question, um, after all your success, Michael, helping all the people you've helped doing, accomplishing so much, 59 years of marriage, um, you know, uh, helping to build an amazing company to billions of dollars worth of art collection after all these years, doing the things that people thought was impossible by making deals with, uh, with, with people overseas and to be able to just accomplish something like all of this artwork, everything we talked about. What's the number one way that you best stay centered in your values and stay encouraged to charge forward to reach even higher heights? Reading the word every day, every morning. That gets me started and keeps me focused and balanced. Because if it were not for that, I would become prideful very quickly, thinking that I had some degree of control for the blessings that our shareholders will receive. Absolutely amazing. Michael Shepard, it's been more than a pleasure. It's been an honor to get to know you a little bit more. I'm so happy that we were able to meet you in person and be able to talk with you on the podcast and start to strategically align to bring investors to uh, to everything you guys are doing at Treasury uh, Treasure, uh, uh, Investment Corp. For our listeners who want to get in touch with you, would you remind them one last time, what's the best place for them to find you? Just please call me directly on my cell, 615-400. You're going to like this 1099. <laughs> it's a tax. It's a tax flow play there. I love that. Thank you, Michael. I also want to thank all of our listeners for listening uh, to this podcast. We're also streaming on three different podcasts, um, especially for guests like Michael that are so special. Uh, there is the capital gains tax, which is podcast. There's also the build to billions podcast, which we're just releasing. And as well as the expert CRE secrets podcast, um, and I just want to thank all of our listeners out there that are supporting one, two, or three of those shows all on YouTube, all on the podcast. Um, and, and, you know, really what we're about is helping you, whether you're building to billions uh, for your next real estate, your next, uh, you know, your next company, um, but for what? So you can give it all away, right? Give it all away, make a huge difference, make a huge impact. Uh, but you also need to have a big, a great tax flow plan, right? So make sure that you're not caught in that that flywheel of wealth just on one piece, but you have a team and a plan in place for when the exit does come. That's what is why we also um, I kind of geek out about tax as well. I hope this was a value to you and inspiration. Please go out and take some action today. And if anything about what Michael and I said, you can contact uh, today that inspired you or you want to take some action. Go right now and book a time with us, capitalgainstaxsolutions.com and or treasureinvestmentscorp.com to learn more. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening, and we will talk to everyone again real soon. Bye now.